Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you with us. You may know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series, which we're concluding this week, is, is about the book of Genesis. And this particular lesson is entitled Israel and Egypt. It's the lesson number 13 for June 25 of 2025. And I just have to make a note that whenever I see June 25, 2022, correct, sorry. Whenever I see the June 25, I think of my father, he would have been 101 um, on this day. Uh, let's begin with the word of prayer as usual. Our kind and wonderful father, we have really enjoyed the challenge of trying to understand better the book of Genesis. We know that there are so many people who have questions about it, don't believe it, think that there's all sorts of problems with it, but we find inspiration here, we find excitement, we find m the patriarchs there that have done such a wonderful thing of living in cooperation with you. May we follow their example in our day as our prayer in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen. Yeah. In this lesson, we're going to note several major themes. The blessings of Jacob, and they point to unquestionably to the coming of the Messiah to be born in the line of Judah. You remember that? Two, they draw attention to several occasions which through God's power evil worked out to be for the good. Think of the selling of Joseph into Egypt by his brothers. Who could have guessed that that would eventually become, through that, he would eventually become the savior of his family, as well as providing the physical salvation for that part of the world. The prophecies of Jacob pointed to the end of time and to the blessings that the descendants of Jacob, Israel, would bring to the entire world to their production of the Bible and spreading of the plan of salvation. Jacob had been convinced by the wonderful gifts that Joseph had sent, as well as by the testimony of his 11 sons, that because of the famine, he and his family should move to Egypt for the preservation of their lives. But he received additional assurance when he was given a vision from God that it was God's will for him to move to Egypt. I want you to think about that for a moment. Where is the promised land? That's in Canaan. You're supposed to move. God tells you to move away from the promised land. That, that's backwards. That's something wrong with that, right? Let's read a bit more about that, Jim. Genesis chapter 46, verse 3. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go to Egypt. I will make your descendants a great, now it says great nation, but it could be a great people, I think is what, yeah. the, what the word says. Good News Translation, American Bible Society. Okay, clearly God interacted with Jacob and his family repeatedly, showing them what the right thing to do was and where they needed to go next. Can we depend upon God for that kind of guidance in our day? I mean, think about the whole story of Joseph, which we've covered in our previous weeks. I mean, can you, is there any explanation for all those, you know, Joseph's dreams, the response of the brothers, selling him to Egypt? I mean, who arranged all that? It has to be God that arranged that whole thing. I don't see how it could have been any other explanation. Well, we're now coming past that story Read Genesis 46 if you get a chance. Just to review, Jacob and his family were welcomed by Joseph into Egypt, moving from starvation to a land of plenty, with plenty of food. Abraham was called out of Haran, and earlier from Ur of the Chaldees, to go into an unknown land where he would be blessed by God. He was told not to fear, but to go. We see Jacob being told not to fear, but to go to Egypt, where his descendants, though suffering through a lot of problems, would grow into an entire nation, family to nation. Um, and I have some questions I'd like to uh, ask you. How many people went down into Egypt? 70. The text says 70. And how many cattle and sheep and so forth went down there? Just a couple. <laughs> Just a couple? <laughs> Probably a couple thousand. thousand. And how many people does it take to care of all, take care of all those fat cattle and sheep? Quite a few. Well, Jacob had 11 sons. Yeah. 
and wives and wives and children. And children. That was 70 there. That's not okay. counting all the... All Abraham the, had large flocks too. Abraham? And he had 318 trained soldiers to protect his flocks. You don't think Jacob had any trained soldiers? He didn't have any trained shepherds that took care of all those flocks? I mean, Jacob was 130 years old at this point. So why does it say 70? Well, that's his immediate descendants. 70 uh, important people. So <laughs> Abraham had about, about a thousand people in his... Soul. Thousand families, thousand heads of household, yeah. Right, and so... This I'm sure there. Jacob had a lot. Well, the reason I'm asking that point is, if you believe the numbers that you read in the Bible and you don't think about any of these, I mean, we need to think about the implications of these things. Someone did some calculations. There are four generations from the time that the family went down into Egypt until the Exodus. And that was about 200 years. So average life generation in those days was 40 to 50 years. Okay. When they, by the time they left Egypt, the men counted 600,000, which we estimate that if you count women and children, that's somewhere close to 2 million. So someone did their little mathematics and figured out in order for it to go from 70 to 2 million in four generations, every woman would have to have 57 children. Myra, <laughs> are you up to that? <laughs> no. Not quite. Huh? So, so the point is, there were a lot, I am sure there were a lot of other people who went down to Egypt with Jacob and his family. So you say a generation was about 40 years then, but it, it changed dramatically from Jacob to his children, which some of them, it sounds like they got married before they were 20 That's and right. had grandchildren yeah. well, you know, at a very young age. So there may be a lot more generations than four. Well, except that when you get to, when we get over to Exodus, when you start talking about Moses and, Ab and, and Aaron, it says they're in the fourth generation. So... That's, I mean, I, I'm, 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 the point is, there's a whole lot of people somewhere that um, we don't normally think about. A comment and a quick question. Uh, we also know that it was a mixed multitude, a lot of Egyptians. They went out. out. Right, right. So yeah. that's one thing to remember. They were convinced that uh, these were the people they wanted to be with. Uh, but didn't that dream and uh, remember the... Uh, Abraham falls asleep and he has that dream and this, yeah. you're Jacob. going to be oh. It was Abraham, I oh, think. Okay. He, he's yeah. Yeah. The, and was it 400 years that they were going to okay. be? Okay, 400, 400 years is years. from the time Abraham was called out of the Ur of Chaldees, oh. from Haran actually. Okay. 430 years from Ur, 400 years from Ur of the Chaldees until they have the Exodus. To, the time, it was about 215 years until they went down into Egypt, and then 215 more years by the time they, they left Egypt. Uh, so, so they th were actually in Egypt for 215 years then? Now it gets a little confusing because in those early days, Canaan was under the control of Egypt. Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world in those days. So you could go into Canaan and still be said, okay, I went down to Egypt. But of course we think Egypt, you know, you got to be actually down into Africa. So, so Egypt perhaps was the first world yeah. power, then came Assyria, and yeah. then uh, Babylon, da da da. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, extra little sidetrack there. There are interesting subtle links in the scripture between the fact that Jacob had 70 descendants into Egypt, going into Egypt, including the family of Joseph who were already living in Egypt, and the 70 nations that were ultimately the descendants of Noah's three sons in Genesis 10. All people on this earth were to be blessed by God's work through the Hebrew people. So now, you've probably noticed in this series of lessons that we, the one who wrote these lessons, was big into Hebrew. And he noticed linkages in, in the Hebrew language, which we, we, don't, we don't get in the translation. But there are things like this as an example. Um, okay, who's got Genesis 46 verse 7 there? Um, Genesis 46, 7. His, Jacob's <coughs> sons, his grandsons, his daughters, and his granddaughters moved to Egypt. Good News Bible. Okay. How many daughters did Jacob have? 
one. Do you know? Why do they say daughters? <laughs> and his granddaughters. <laughs> Maybe there were some unnamed grand or daughters, or maybe they would have been named in that family. They would have been named, or maybe it includes all women. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, through the descendants of Jacob, Israel, and the knowledge of the salvation of man, the, the knowledge of the salvation of man was spread. It was not just for the children of Abraham or Israel to be blessed, but also for all the world. And we have. Several verses that point that out. Carrie? Um, quoting from Romans chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. This includes everyone because there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. God is the same Lord of all and richly blesses all who call to him. As the scripture says, everyone who calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. And that's from the Good News Bible. In Galatians 3, 28 to 29, so there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between the men and women. You are all one in union with Christ. Jesus. I'm going to interrupt you there for a second, uh, Charles. Do you remember the famous, this is, who, who wrote this passage Paul. in Genesis 3? Who was uh, Paul? Genesis 3, uh, Galatians 3. Galatians. Yeah. Who, who is Paul? That's what what Paul is known back in his early days, he was a what? Pharisee, Pharisee of the Pharisees. Pharisee of the Pharisees. Do you know what the Pharisee prayer was every morning? Thank God that I am not a woman or a, a Gentile, a, a slave or a woman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what or the order was. I think it was that order. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And what's he saying here? There's no difference between men and women. <clears throat> no difference between slave and free. That's a change of heart. Wow. The Very gospel, gospel yeah. did something to him, right? If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Good news, Bible. So we've been, we've been talking about the descendants of Abraham, well, actually the descendants of Jacob, who were descendants of Abraham. And now Abraham, I mean, Paul says, that's all of us. Mm. It might seem counterintuitive for Jacob to leave the land of promise, all of which had been promised to his grandfather, to go into the land of Egypt, which we realize became a land of captivity and slavery for the Israelites. However, it is important to realize that if the family of Jacob slash Israel had remained in Canaan or had intermarried with the Egyptians, they would have faded into one of those groups. If either had happened, we would never have heard of the Israelites. We, that's a, that's a major point that I, I don't think we really talk about. So would the Bible have ever come about? Would Jesus ever have come? Probably the first not. time? It would have been very different to what it was. They had to leave Canaan, where most of the sons of Jacob had married Canaanite wives, and go to Egypt, where the Egyptians were forbidden to associate with shepherds because of Pharaoh's experience with Abraham in order to grow into a distinct, separate nation. So God had this all planned. You know, we, all, we often talk that God had this all planned, but uh, this, this really seems like plan C or D to me. <laughs> when, I think, when I think back about pre-flood and what God's plan really was. Yeah. Well, of course, the original plan was in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's where we should be. Okay, remember, let's go back to that story. Remember the story of Abraham during his first visit to Egypt? The Lord in his providence had brought this trial upon Abraham to teach him the lessons of submission, patience, and faith. Lessons that, we were, to, that were to be placed on record for the benefit of all who should afterwards be called to endure affliction. God leads his children by way that they, they, not, they know not but he does not forget or cast off those who put their trust in him. Abraham, Abraham had been greatly favored by the king. Even now, Pharaoh would permit no harm to come to him or his company, but ordered a guard to conduct them in safety out of his domains. At this time, laws were made prohibiting the Egyptians from intercourse, interaction, intercourse or interaction with foreign shepherds in 
any such familiarity as eating or drinking with them. Does that remind you of anything we've been yeah. studying the last few weeks? Yeah. Yeah. Joseph sits over there, pretends like he speaks only Egyptian. His sons are sitting over there, and he, he's understanding perfectly well everything. They, and then there's a ter interpreters over here. Wow. Um, Pharaoh's dismissal of Abraham was kind and generous, but he bade him leave Egypt, for he dared not permit him to remain. He had ignorantly been about to do him a serious injury, but God had interposed and saved the monarch from committing so great a sin. Pharaoh saw in this stranger a man whom God of heaven honored, and he feared to have in his kingdom one who would so evidently so was so evidently under divine favor. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second now. Pharaoh claimed to be what? God. 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 So why is he worried about somebody who has real connections with God? Well, there was a God more powerful than. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh boy, we got a conflict here, right? Yeah. Well, uh, very quickly, uh, uh, the Lake Genesaret. You know, mm -hmm. people living around believed that the wind and the waves were gods. And mm -hmm. here is a man who is asleep and wakes, stands up and says, Peace be still. And then the mm -hmm. disciples say, What? Yeah. Yeah. So they realize that these people here believe that uh, this, is, this is God. And here is someone, we, we're in his presence, who is stronger than. And I have a feeling that the winds on that particular occasion were not just ordinary winds. There was someone who would have Same. loved to drown everybody in that boat. <laughs> yes. The yes. devil was busy working. I'm sorry. Byra, go ahead. Uh, I, well, I have to remember where I was. Should. Uh, should Abraham remain in Egypt, his increasing wealth and honor would likely to excite an, uh, the envy and covetous, covetousness of the Egyptians, and some injury might be done to be done him, for which the monarch would be held responsible, which might again bring judgments upon the royal house. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 129, paragraph I am, 2. I am so glad we have these insights from Ellen White that make the, the stories yeah. stick together. And, oh, wow, you see, look. Okay, so that's the reason that happened, right? Well, moving now to Genesis 47. I'm not going to take time to read the chapter. When the family of Jacob arrived in Egypt, Joseph realized that there were two things he needed to do. First, he took five of his brothers and introduced them to Pharaoh and told them they must tell Pharaoh what? That they were herders of cattle and sheep. This reminds us of the time when Abraham was in Egypt and lied about his wife. As a result of Abraham's lie, as we just read from Ellen White, the Egyptians made a rule that Egyptians could not associate with shepherds. Thus was assured the survival of the Hebrew people. Second, Joseph took, Abraham, took Jacob to Pharaoh and introduced him. Jacob was not overwhelmed by the splendor of the Egyptian pharaoh, but blessed him, recognizing that as one who was directly guided by the God of heaven, he, Jacob, was superior to this heathen king. Question. Why did Joseph take only five of his eleven brothers to pharaoh? Any insight into that? that I don't. I, I suspect he probably didn't want to overwhelm pharaoh. Number one, he probably should pick the five most appropriate ones, and the ones he thought were best. Hmm. I, I've wondered about that one as well. He probably did not take Simeon there. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Just because he tried to kill him. So. so, from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, Joseph took five of his brothers to present to Pharaoh and receive from him the grant of the land for their future home. Gratitude to his prime minister would have led the monarch to honor them, that is the brothers, with appointments to offices of state. But Joseph, true to the worship of Jehovah, sought to save his brothers from the temptations to which they would be exposed at a heathen court. Therefore he counseled them, when questioned by the king, to tell him their occupation frankly. The sons of Jacob followed this counsel, being careful not, being careful also to state that they had come to sojourn in the land, not to become permanent dwellers there, thus reserving the right to depart if they chose. 
the king assigned them a home as offered in the best of the land of the country of Goshen. Patriarchs and Prophets 233, paragraph 2. Okay, why was Goshen the best of the land? The delta area. The delta area, what does that mean? It's watered. Very fertile. It's watered, but it's that's oil. not... That's not all. The soil, the, soil, from, the soil has come all the way from Ethiopia and Kenya and Tanzania and Burundi and Rwanda and a little bit of Congo and Uganda all the way, all, all the, the way down soil. here. Nice topsoil. There had to have some, been some migration as well. People who are living there, they had to leave so that these new people could. Move. Probably, yes, very likely. Well, Jacob chose to bless Pharaoh for the way he treated his family. It also meant that Jacob recognized his superiority to that heathen king. And what about us? Are we not supposed to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people? So if we, are, if we go to Congress, we should be able to raise our hands and bless them, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Think about that one. Joseph had made arrangements for the country of Egypt to store an enormous amount of grain. It was purchased and stored at a time when it was very cheap, during those years of plenty. Later he sold it back to the Egyptians at a much higher price and eventually required all the Egyptians to sell their land and themselves to Pharaoh in order to buy food. Meanwhile, the children of Israel were growing and becoming a nation. Then we move next to Genesis 49, first 28 verses. As Jacob approached the end of his life of 147 years, Jacob blessed his sons one by one. Mm. Um, and I think we have time to read at least a part of that. Um, Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around and I will tell you what will happen to you in the future. Now, where did he get that information? From the Lord. Yeah, dream. Must be. Come together and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, my firstborn, you are my strength and the first child of my manhood. The proudest and strongest of all my sons, you are like a raging flood, but you will not be the most important, for you slept with my concubine and dishonored your father's bed. Simeon and Levi are brothers. They use their weapons to commit violence. I will not join in their secret talks, nor will I take part of their meetings. Do you remember that story, right? They killed in anger, and they crippled bulls for sport. They're there are the Shechemites, they wanted to be a part of the Israelites. They were circumcised, and then Simeon and Levi showed up while all the men were hurting. And yet Levi's sons or descendants became the priests. Yep. Yeah. Spiritual leaders. A curse be on their anger because it is so fierce, and on their fury because it is so cruel. I will scatter them throughout the land of Israel. I will disperse them among his people. And how was that fulfilled? The priests. Were scattered. They were scattered. Right, right, the they were not given a par portion of the land except for a little piece around Jerusalem itself. Other than that, they were scattered all the way through the land in what came to be called the cities of refuge. Yeah, Twelve of them scattered all the way through the country, and that's where the Levites had their property. So they were um, scattered around. Um, Judah, your brothers will praise you. You hold your enemies by the neck. Your brothers will bow down before you. Judah is like a lion, killing his victim and returning to his den, stretching out, lying down. No one dares disturb him. Judah will hold the royal scepter, and his descendants will always rule. Nations will bring him tribute and bow in obedience before him. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read any more than that. Um, but that's the important part we're going to talk about. He the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until the Shiloh comes, so that was the promise. And what happens after Shiloh comes? And to, and to him the gathering of the people will be. Shall be, and he's going to rule for how long? Forever. Forever, that's right. I've often wondered about the relationship of these people when we get to heaven. Mm. Will Jacob come up to Jesus and says, you know, Hi, great, 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 great grandson, or something like that. <laughs> I, 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 I wonder specifically about Joseph and Mary. Would Jesus come up to them in heaven and say, Thank you, Mom, thank you, Dad? Hmm. Well, he might have. He respected them when he was on the ground. Yeah. 
It's interesting. Yeah. Well, he called for Joseph's sons. Now this is Jacob called for Joseph's sons to be brought to him. Instead of blessing Joseph directly, he blessed Joseph's two sons, recognizing that the young would be greater than his older brother. By bringing the two son, his two sons to Jacob for him to bless them, Joseph received the double portion of his father's inheritance. So what was the firstborn supposed to receive? Spiritual. The spiritual birthright and what else? A double portion. A double portion. So what did Jason, what did, who got the spiritual blessing? Jacob. Judah. Yeah. Judah got the spiritual blessing. His, his was the kingly line. His, the, and he, through him was shadow, the Christ was right. born. Right. But then the double portion came to Ephraim and Manasseh. So, so interesting because Joseph was already rich, presumably because of his connections in Egypt. Yes. Why would he need a double portion? Or is this symbolic? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's symbolic because obviously, I mean, Jacob went down to Egypt because he was starving. Hmm. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't, and I don't, I mean, I, I, I have all sorts of questions about these stories of which I wish I could answer. I mean, what happened to all the animals? I would think they would, they would starve before the people would. Um, anyway. They wouldn't have any food to eat. By bringing his two sons to Jacob for him to bless them, Joseph received the double portion of his father's inheritance. As Jacob elevated Ephraim and Manasseh to be treated as though they were his own sons, none of the other grandsons of Jacob received that honor. And when it finally comes down to the ultimate blessing, whose names are found on the gates of the New Jerusalem? Wow. Well, while blessing goes to, while you think about that, while blessing those two grandsons and his sons, Jacob reviewed several of the very difficult times in his own life. He pronounced on them the blessing that he knew that God had pronounced on them. As we know from the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the tribe of Dan wandered away and basically separated itself from the children of Israel. I don't have time to review that history, but I hope you're familiar with it. And Dan's name is not there. As a result, Dan's name was dropped from the list of the 12 sons of Jacob. In its place is the name of Ephraim instead of Joseph. The tribe of Manasseh is named in Revelation instead of Dan. And that's, you remember Revelation 7, 5, and 8? 12,000 from each tribe, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. In that case, Joseph here would, re would uh, refer to, they had Manasseh, you see, and Joseph stands in the place of Ephraim. Any questions about that? Many of those who believe in predestination believe that those prophecies were fulfilled at God's command thus predetermining the fate of those brothers. I will say, although I'm not a prophet, that is not true. God is able to foresee the future and he was able to tell in advance what the descendants of each of those sons of Israel were going to do and what they were going to become. Particularly noteworthy in the group is the story of Jacob's blessing of Judah. The Lion of Judah, was given the spiritual inheritance by becoming the ancestors of Jesus Christ. Why did Judah receive that blessing of becoming the future king, li kingly line as opposed to Joseph? That was Gordon's question here a moment ago. Anybody want to try to guess? Well, think about what happened here. Judah was the one who basically saved Joseph. And although he had all sorts of wild times in his own family, he seemed to be, I mean, he, he saved Joseph and then he, in effect, saved Benjamin when he had to plead for Joseph, to, to Benjamin, I mean, plead to Joseph for Benjamin's life. So you can see that in terms of his, uh, his uh, caring about other people and willing to sacrifice himself in place of those other people, Judah seemed to be the spiritual leader. And of course, uh, he, go ahead. He only had uh, sexual relations with one, with one prostitute that we know of, his, yeah. his daughter-in-law. <laughs> yeah. Or Good who he thought was a prostitute. <laughs> Pardon? Probably an insightful qualification there that you yeah. entered that way. Okay. 
Well, the important point is Judah will hold the royal scepter and his zenits will always rule. Nations will bring him tribute and bow in obedience before him. His ties, he ties his young donkey to a grapevine to the very best of the vines. He washes his clothes in blood red wine. His eyes are bloodshot from drinking wine. His teeth white from drinking milk. Hmm. Does that sound like the kind of thing you would like to have said about you? Maybe some of the things you read earlier in there in Genesis forty nine <laughs> about about Judah, but not that last part. Well, this is part of the the prophecy as well. Yeah. Well, Jacob and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, Jacob in prophetic vision saw the hope of the coming Messiah. Notice its expression, quote, in the last days. This expression is used in several places in the Old Testament and the New Testament, suggesting the time of the end. See Isaiah 2, 2 and Daniel 10, 14, just for now. Let me just hit Daniel 10, 14. I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people. In my Good News Bible, it says in the future. It's in the last days. This is a vision about the future. While we have free will and choice, God does not limit our freedom. But he does have ways that we do not understand for knowing the future. And he knew that one day Jesus Christ would be born in the line of Judah. I think that probably has a lot to do with David and his experiences. While he wasn't any saint all his life, he, uh, he set up a, a, a line that was very good. And we know about what came in that line, don't we? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, a child is born to us. A son is given to us, and he will be our ruler. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. His royal power will continue to grow. His kingdom will always be at peace. He will rule as King David's successor, basing his power on right and justice from now until the end of time. The Lord Almighty is determined to do all this. Okay, so who is that, of course? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, very much so. But this promise included more than just the arrival of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the first time. It extends down to all eternity and including what we read in Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Jim? So, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord in, to the glory of the God of the Father. Good news, Bible. Okay. Now, I, this is a very important verse, so we don't have time to explain it in all details. But this verse says every single individual who has ever lived in the history of our world, the wicked, the righteous, everyone, including Satan himself, will one day have to bow down and admit that God, is, that God did everything he possibly could to save everyone. It's not that they'll be required to, it's that they, because of, that they are convinced that they, that the, this is true. The evidence will be compelling. As Ellen White wrote about the tribe of Judah, Twain? The lion, king of the forest, is a fitting symbol of this tribe from which came David and the son of David, Shiloh, the true lion of the tribe of Judah, to whom all powers shall finally bow and all nations render homage. That's Ellen White's wording for Philippians, I mean, Philippians 2, 10, 11 there. It is interesting to note that Jacob's blessing of his children is the third time in the book of Genesis that a blessing was addressed to an entire group of people. Now, the entire group of people wasn't always a huge, lar large group. The blessing God gave to Adam and Eve at their creation. So there's a group of two. The blessing given to Noah's three sons, outlining their future um, destinies. And three, Jacob expressed his blessings for his children. So we have groups of two, group of three, and a group of 12. The first blessing to Adam and Eve was to 100% of the people that were there. That's right. On the entire earth. population of the earth. That's right. What about Dinah? Didn't she get a blessing? Hmm. 
Okay, well, we're living in patriarchal, patriarchal times, aren't we? In the midst of those blessings, he blessed Judah, saying that a scepter, a lawgiver, would not depart with, from his descendants for all time. This, of course, can only refer to the fact that at the, at the second coming of Jesus, he will become the king who rules the university, the university, the universe for eternity. Sorry, I'm so used to thinking of university. The descendants of Jacob will include one to whom all the nations of the world will come <clears throat> and give obeisance. So why was Judas' descendant capitalized, described as riding a donkey? Horses were offensive weapons for military conquest. Donkeys were for kings to ride upon. Hmm. Carrie? Reading from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion. Shout for joy, your people, no, you people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Lord says, I will remove the war chariots from Israel and take the horses from Jerusalem. The bows used in battle will be destroyed. Your king will make peace among the nations. He will rule from sea to sea, from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. From Good News Bible. Okay, so who's that one that was riding on the donkey? Jesus. And this is how it happened. Charles? Yep. Uh, just before that, this is shortly before he went to the cross. Yes shortly before he went to the cross. Yeah, Mark. Jesus Jesus and his disciples with a whole lot of, a huge gang of people on Friday and cl climbed up that road from Jericho to Jerusalem yes. and then Saturday night there was that yes. meal, meal and then Sunday morning Hang on the that cross. triumphal entry, yes. Right. Right. Yes, and, um, and there were thousands and thousands of people from all over the world in Jerusalem at the time. It was Passover feast, so they watched this happen. And they were waiting for what to happen? For Jesus to be crowned. Yes. For Jesus to be crowned king, that's right. Mark 11, 1 through 11, Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village, they're ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden until it and uh, untie. untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you are doing that, tell him that the master needs it and will send it back at once. <laughs> I wonder, you know, the master needs it. Did they all know who they were talking about? Did everyone, everyone in Jerusalem know? And think about the owner. Because he thought, I'm sure he thought, okay, the king is going to ride my donkey. Yes. Yeah. They went and found a colt out on the street and tied to the door of a house. As they were untying uh, it, someone of the bystanders asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them, and the bystanders let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their clothes on it, the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground, on the road, while others cut branches in the fields and spread them on the road. The people who were in front of those who followed behind the, uh, began to shout, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the coming kingdom of King David, our father. Praise God. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and looked around, around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Goodness Bible. Well, we need to honor and worship Jesus Christ because he is our creator and redeemer. But not only that but also he wants to be our friend for the rest of eternity. We will bow down to him and cast our crowns before him because that kind of power combined with that kind of humility and friendship is truly divine. There's no other place where you can find that kind of combination. 
It is interesting to notice as we come to the end of the book of Genesis that both Jacob and Joseph commanded the, their descendants and their associates to take their remains to the land of Canaan because that was the land of promise. Even though they were at that point in time in Egypt, they looked forward to being returned to Canaan and saw it as the land where the new Jerusalem would come down to this earth and God would rule the world forever. It's also interesting to notice that Jacob's bones were taken to Canaan and buried without mention of a coffin. And who went up there to bury his bones? You remember? I think all the sons, didn't they? Although I think all the sons plus a whole lot of Egyptian dignitaries. Yeah. It was a huge gathering. Carry the bones of, jo of Jacob up there at 147 years old. Was this cave of Machpelah by any chance, or was it? Yeah. The, where Abraham and others were? Yeah, cave, cave of Machpelah. By contrast, Joseph's embalmed remains, now of course as a higher level Egyptian official, he would be carefully embalmed, uh, were kept in a coffin until he was carried to Canaan without mentioning any grave. And who carried him up to Canaan? I think the children of Israel as they... The children of Israel at the Exodus. Yeah. He didn't get carried up to the land of Canaan until the Exodus. Oh. And they buried him when they got to, after four, they're, want, they're carrying his coffin around in, in, in the wilderness for 40 years. So he was carried to Canaan without mentioning any grave. In connection with Joseph's request that his body be carried to Canaan, he mentioned that God would bless them and they would return to Canaan. Compare Ellen White's book, Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 239 and 240, and the following passage is from the book Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, 157 to 159. Okay? See, that would be mine. Some have suggested that the life of Joseph was a type of the life of Christ. What parallels do you see? Read the story in the Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, pages 157 to 159, as we reviewed two weeks ago in lesson 11. So let's just look at those again. I think this is a wonderful summary of Joseph, the Jacob and Joseph story. Joseph illustrates Christ. Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. He was rejected and despised because his acts were righteous and he, his consistent self-denying life was a continual rebuke upon those who professed piety but whose lives were corrupt. Joseph's integrity and virtue were furiously assailed. And Fierce. she... Fiercely. Yeah, fiercely. all right. And she, Potiphar's wife, who would lead him astray... Who wanted who, to lead him, basically. Who would yeah. lead him astray could not prevail. Therefore, her hatred was strong against the virtue and integrity which she could not corrupt. She testified falsely against him. The innocent suffered because of his righteousness. He was cast into prison because of his virtue. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. So here we see Joseph was arrested and suffered because he was faithful, and so was Jesus, okay? So now, we notice again, Joseph was sold to his enemies by his family. Jesus was betrayed for money by one of his disciples. And from Spirit of Prophecy, same page, in paragraph 157, Joseph was sold to his enemies by his brethren for a small sum of money. The Son of God was sold to his bitterest enemies by one of his own disciples. For just about the same amount of money. <laughs> wow. Jesus was humble and meek, and he refused to use his power to fight his enemies. I mean, what, remember the statement that Jesus made? I could call 12 legions of angels right now, right? Joseph humbly served God in whatever place he found himself. Back to Ellen White again. Jesus was meek and holy. His, life was, his was a life of unexampled self-denial, goodness, and holiness. He was not guilty of any wrong, yet false witnesses were hired to testify against him. He was hated because he had been a faithful reprover of sin and corruption. Same, I bet, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 157. So Joseph and Jesus were both stripped of their coats. 
Joseph's brethren stopped, excuse me, stripped him of his coat of many colors. The executioners of Jesus cast lots for his a seamless coat. Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Same volume place. 1, page 157. Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him, but finally sold him as a slave because they were jealous of him. The Jewish leaders arrested Jesus and arranged for his trial and crucifixion because they were jealous of his miraculous powers and his influence with the people. Joseph's brethren purposed to kill him, but were finally content to sell him as a slave to prevent his becoming greater than themselves. <laughs> they thought they had placed him where they, they would be no more troubled with his dreams and where there would be no possibility of their fulfillment. But the very course which they pursued, God overruled to bring about that which they designed never should take place, that he should have dominion over them. <laughs> Amazing. Go ahead, Gary. Okay. The chief priests and elders were jealous of Christ that he would draw the attention of the people away from themselves to him. They knew that he was doing greater works than they ever had done or ever could perform. And they knew that if he were suffered to continue his teachings, he would become higher in authority than they and might become king of the Jews. They agreed together to prevent this by privately taking him and hiring witnesses to testify falsely against him, that they might condemn him and put him to death. They would not accept him as their king, but cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! The Jews thought that by taking the <laughs> life of Christ they could prevent his becoming king. But by murdering the Son of God, they were bringing about the very thing they sought to prevent. Mrs. White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 158, paragraph 1 and 2. Amazing. Yeah. Despite the terrible treatment that both Joseph and Jesus received, each rose to take the preeminent position that God had planned for him and then capital him. In neither case did it lessen the guilt of those responsible. Charles? Joseph, being sold by his brethren into Egypt, became a savior to his family's, father's family. Yet this fact did not lessen the guilt of his brethren. The crucifixion of Christ by his enemies made him the redeemer of, the man, of mankind, the savior of the fallen race, and ruler over the world, whole world. The crime of his enemies was just as heinous as though God's providential hand had not controlled events for his own glory and the good of man. Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 158, paragraph 2. Despite everything that Satan could throw at them, neither Joseph nor Jesus could be persuaded to depart in the least manner from his, cap his walk with God. In the end, both graciously forgave those who had done them wrong. Continuing on in Spirit of Prophecy, page 159. Joseph walked with God. He would not be persuaded to deviate from the paths of righteousness and trans transgress God's law by any increments or threats. Inducements. Inducements, sorry. And when he was imprisoned and suffered because of his innocence, he meekly bore it without murmuring. His self-control and patience in adversity and his unwavering fidelity were left on record for the benefit of all who should afterward live on the earth. When Joseph's brethren acknowledged their sin before him, he freely forgave them and showed by his acts of benevolence and love that he harbored no resentful feelings for their formal cruel contact, con conduct toward him. The life of Jesus, the Savior of the world, was a pattern of benevolence, goodness, and holiness. Yet he was despised and insulted, mocked, derided, and for no other reason than because of his righteous life, which was a constant rebuke to sin. His enemies would not be satisfied until he was given in, into their hands that they might put him to a shameful death. He died for the guilty race, and while suffering the most cruel torture 
meekly forgave his murderers. Mm -hmm. He rose from the dead, ascended up to his Father, and received all power and authority, and returned to the earth again to impart it to his disciples. He gave gifts unto man, and all who have ever come to him, repentant, confessing their sins, he has received them into his favor and freely pardoned them. And if they remain true to him, he will exalt them to his throne and make their, their heirs to the, make them heirs to the inheritance which he purchased with his own blood. Do you think God arranged that incredible parallel between the experience of Joseph and the experience of Jesus? I mean, what a... Yeah. Just boom, 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 right down through that story. But Joseph chose to follow. He really, truly stands out from mm -hmm. all his brothers. And oh, yes. Sister. Mm -hmm. Really, truly. He made a choice. Even yeah. Well, he made several choices. That's right. But he made a choice to follow the instructions that he was given. Yeah. Yeah. So why do you think the brothers of Joseph were so worried about what would happen to them after their father died? Did they have any reason to be worried about the behavior of Joseph himself? Or did they just feel guilty? Some people yeah, have... A lifetime of guilt. <laughs> yeah. Some people have suggested the book of Genesis can be summarized by reading the first five words and the last four words. In the beginning, God created a coffin in Egypt. This certainly represents the story of the entrance of sin to this earth. But the messages we have already seen in this lesson suggest that God will turn evil into good. And we've got two verses for that. Look at Genesis 50, verse 20. You plotted evil against me, but God turned it into good in order to preserve the lives of many people who are alive today because of what happened. And Paul, picking that up, said in Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, God works for good. And by the way, I have to point this out every time I read from my Good News Bible. The King James Version says, all things work together for good. No, that's not true. As this, the, Satan causes a lot of evil things to happen. But the, what it says in, in, in the Greek is, in all things, God works for good when he can with those who, uh, with the, with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purposes. So the, God's name ought to be near at the beginning of that verse and not at the end. So we see that Genesis, be, Genesis begins with the glorious creation and ends with the death in Egypt. The Pentateuch begins the same way and ends with the death of Moses on Mount Nebo, a death without a grave, without a known burial place. From the Adult Teachers Bible Study Guide, page 174, there is a story about a New Testament teacher who said to his students, quote, if you want to be a good Christian, you will have to kill the Jew in you, end quote. Then one student answered, do you mean killing Jesus? How does the blessing of Jacob to his sons relate to you personally? Is it possible to receive the blessings of Jacob while denying their Jewish component? What makes these blessings your blessings as well? And I'm going to throw that lesson, that question out to you who are listening. How much of this information that we've just studied today and thinking back to all of Genesis, what kind of lessons should we be learning from all these stories? I mean, look, at here's Joseph. We've just traced his story and, and so much like the, 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 the story of Jesus in many, many respects. And what, what's implied by this idea? Can you be a Christian without killing the Jew in you? What, what does that mean? Are we talking about Pharisees here? Or, yeah. or is that too hard a question? Or is it even correct? Or is it even correct? Well, the Jew in you, is that... Uh having the the gifts that were given to those people I, i'm not sure what the jew is. i think I, I think he's talking about new testament situation in the new testament and how the people so many of the jews rejected jesus that was 
that's the way I understood that. Oh, the, uh, who were the priests? The priests yeah. were Sadducees, right? And they mm. didn't believe uh, mm -hmm. in the things they were standing up for. But. Okay, our church's name, Seventh-day Adventist, suggests we believe in God's creation. What part of that name talks about God's creation? Seventh-day. Seventh-day. Seventh-day, what does that have to do with creation? In seven days, and the seventh day was the rest. Remember. We believe that creation happened, the creation of this world happened in seven literal days. We talked about that back when we were doing the first few uh, lessons in this series. And seventh day, that means we believe that God literally made everything. We believe in the creation story. We, we reject the idea of, of evolutionists who do er, are doing everything they possibly can to reject God and to throw God out of their lives. And Adventists, what is that? What part does that imply? Far up to His coming. We're looking forward not on not just well. We we worship. I mean we honor his first advent, but we're looking forward to his second advent and his third advent, still to come. And we hope the second advent will be soon. So we suggest that we believe in the in God created the entire universe. And, it, and I'm interested to know now that they have this new web telescope. And what are they going to do with this new web telescope? Remember what the claims are? they're going to be able to see back to creation. <laughs> the beginning of the universe. Are they going to find a salamander? They don't call it creation. Huh? They don't call it creation. They don't call it creation. Back to the beginnings of the universe. It also points forward to the final events connected with the second and third advents that will turn this world into the dwelling place of God himself. And so this little world, this little blue marble out here in space, is going to end up being what? The center of the universe. The center of the universe. Well, the center because because, because of what? God's very presence. Yeah. His throne is going to Why be. would God choose to come to this place and make this place his eternal residence for the rest of eternity? Because it shows the outworking of his plan. This is a place where he the won solution. the great controversy. controversy. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for these lessons which have reminded us of some of the great patriarchs and the great uh, saints of the past. We've now been focusing particularly on the lives of Jacob and especially Joseph. What, a, what an incredible, what incredible people they were and what the, what lives they lived. We look so much forward to the day when we'll be able to walk up to them and say, tell me, Tell me of the stories. What happened? How much of these, how many other stories that we don't know anything about because they're not recorded in the scriptures happened to you? We look forward to that day when the entire panorama of the great controversy from beginning to end will be shown in the sky. May it be soon, mm -hmm. is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.